But we're excited to be here this morning because we are going to do something that I've never had a chance to do, not in this setting. But I'm excited to talk to you about the Word this morning. And this morning, I'm going to talk to you for just a few minutes about covenants. I'm going to talk to you about covenants. And there's one thing that I want you to know as you leave this place today, if there's, you get anything, I would like for you to get this. And what I would like for you to get is this, is that covenant and contract are not synonymous. Contracts are not the same thing as covenant. Now we're going to end with that here in just a few minutes, but that's the thing that I want you to know. They're two different things. This week has been an interesting week um, in that we are seeing lots of things happening in the world, aren't we? You know, and it's just no surprise that as we were in men's group on Wednesday, we started talking about things that were happening in the Middle East and, you know, how things are firing up with Israel. And, and I just want you to know something. There's always something going on with Israel. There's always somebody that's looking to get after Israel. And today, the title of this message is called Blessings and Celebration. Somebody this morning is going, why in the world do you have a title of a sermon talk, uh, it, titled Blessings and Celebration when you're opening up talking about what's happening to Israel. And if you haven't watched the news in the last couple of weeks, man, there's just been, it's just a mess. It is just a mess. But I want you to know it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. If you would, open your Bibles with me to Genesis chapter 12, verse 3. What do you mean it's going to be okay? This is what's happening. We are in an election year. Is anybody not aware of that? Is anybody not aware of what's happen, happening with the Democratic Convention and the Republic? I mean, you've, you've heard all that, right? Assassination attempt, change of nominees. One thing that we can't do is, is that we can't get sucked into the news. We can't get sucked into it. And it's hard during an election year because we do want to be informed. We want to make the greatest decision that we can make when it comes to uh, election time. And we want to make those decisions based on information that we get. But more importantly, we want to make those uh, decisions based on Scripture and what the Word tells us. But a lot of times we go to outside sources other than the Word for information. And we just want to be careful doing that. And as we have done that, and, I, and as I have done that, over the last couple of weeks, I've kind of got sucked in. I've got sucked in a little bit, and all I'm hearing is negative, 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 negative. Israel this, and Hamas this, and all the things that are happening in the Middle East. Yes, there are things happening in the Middle East. There will always be things happening in the Middle East. Genesis chapter 12, verse 3 says this, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. This is God speaking through Moses, and he is saying, this you, he is talking about Israel. And he's saying, I will bless those who bless Israel. So when we get those things start to happen, and we start to get this negative feeling, and we start to get mad and upset, just remember what God said about Israel. God has a covenant with Israel. He has a covenant with them. He's not going to let anything happen that he doesn't want to happen. Our job is simply not to wring our hands and to get upset about it. Our job is to simply know that they are his chosen people, his chosen land, and that he is in covenant with them and everything's going to be okay. Well, saying, but can't we do something? Yeah, we can do something. Absolutely, we can do something. To the Jew first. Right, I'm excited right now at Encounter Church. Encounter Church is, is fixing to step into an opportunity to where we're really, really going to get to help Israel by helping out some classes at WT, get books so they can teach at a college level what is going on in Israel. I'm excited about that. I'm excited about that. Psalm 122 verse 6 says this, Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. Peace be within your walls, prosperity within your palaces. For the sake of my brethren and companions, I will say, peace be with you. Because the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. We do have a part to play, and there's something that God wants us to do when it comes to the things that are going on in the Middle East. He is saying, hey, just simply, just pray for them. 
Just pray for the peace of Jerusalem. That's all I want you to do. I'll take care of the rest. Can we do that? Can we do that within our families, in our communities, and in our churches? Absolutely. It's important. The peace of Jerusalem is important. It's this little bitty country with this little bitty tiny city that some of the major, the, the greatest things in history are going to happen. The greatest prophecy that's going to be fulfilled in the Bible is when Jesus comes back to Jerusalem. He's going to come back into the garden. He's going to enter through the east gate. That is going to be the greatest thing that we've ever seen, and it's going to happen right there. The word says it's going to happen. So no matter how much we worry about it, no matter how much we watch Fox News and CNN News, we are not going to stop Jesus from coming back. How many of you know that Jesus is coming back? Amen. And the thing to get excited about is, is that, yeah, we can see all of these things. The scripture tells us, look, we are living in the end times. Most Christian scholars believe that the end times started when we start, when World War I started. And that, that's how close it is. That's how close we are to the beginning of living in the end times. But we don't need to be afraid. And the scriptures tell us in the end times, we're going to see wars on large scales, earthquake, disease, crime, deteriorating attitudes, breakdown of family, and diminished love of God. Are those all true? Have we seen those things with our own eyes? We have seen those things. We see those things in our community on a daily basis. So, hey, it's just another reason for us to be excited. We are seeing prophecy. We are seeing biblical prophecy being fulfilled on a level that no other human has ever seen. And that's why I'm excited. I am not fearful. I am excited for the things that I am seeing. And we can celebrate that. I'm going to say that again. And we can celebrate that. How many of you are excited for Jesus to come back? I'm excited for Jesus to come back. We don't have to be distressed. We can be excited. I say that because this is a message of uttermost importance. I cannot think of a greater time for men to step up and to be the spiritual head of their household and get their families to church. Jesus is coming back a lot quicker than any of us thought. I can't think of a greater time for us to get plugged into the local church. And if you don't have a local church home, come to Encounter. We'll add seats. We've got room because the local church is the greatest place for something good to happen in your life. But also on the other end, being inside the local church and being plugged into the local church, it's also the greatest place to be when there's tragedy that hits. I've said this example before, but I call it the, to the, the toilet paper effect, right? Right? How many of you know when the toilet paper gets, starts to get small that it goes really, really quick, right? Doesn't it seem like it goes a lot quicker than, than uh, it usually does? That's what's happening in the era that we're in, in the church age, in the end of times. Our time is running down, and that's okay, and this is not a message of fear. This is a message to encourage us, to get us excited about spiritual things that are happening. God has a covenant with Israel. But you know that he also has a covenant with us. You know, so many times things happen. And I remember uh, just a few months ago when uh, the wildfires hit and we were all posting and we were posting Psalm 91 over everything. If you looked at Facebook, you looked at our Facebook here at church, it was Psalm number one. It was, it was a, a blessing. It was a prayer. It was a covenant of protection. But I want to say this, as good as this is, the covenant that we are in now with God is so much better. It is so much better. God has something so much better than Psalm 91 for us. Titus chapter 3 verse 5 says this. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of the regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. God saved us. God has given us the opportunity to be saved. God saved me right here at this church. And that's, I'm excited about that. And I never, ever, ever want to take that for granted. And when I was saved, when I made Jesus Christ Lord of my life, I entered into the greatest covenant known to man. Amen. 
And the great thing about it is that's not just for me. That's for everybody. The Bible says for all who make Jesus Lord of your life, you step into this covenant. And the word says that we are saved. And when you look at this word saved in the Greek, what you find is is that it, it is more than just spending eternity with God. Which was, if that was it, if that was it, that would be good enough. But that's not the definition of saved. In the Greek, the word saved means sozo. And that means when we make Jesus Lord of our life, when we step into this covenant, it is now. It means that we can say that God is good right now. We don't have to say, man, things are going to be awesome in six weeks when God does this for me. Or things are going to be better next week when God does this for me. No, God is good right now. The covenant that he has with us is right now. And we can celebrate that because that word saved in the Greek means, hey, there's physical healing available for those that can receive it and want to receive it. It means that we're made whole and it means that we are delivered and we are preserved. Not only just just everywhere, we have a hedge of protection around us everywhere. Everywhere we go, we can step into a place and say that we're saved. That's the contract, not the contract. That is the covenant that we are in right now. That is how you start to live in the fullness of God. And I've been asking this to the congregation of Encounter Church over the last couple of weeks. Who wants to live in the fullness of God? I want to live in the fullness of God and understanding the fullness of God is something that we need to comprehend, something that we need to be proud of, something that we can celebrate and be bold about. But to get there, To get there, we have to understand the covenant that God has made with us. And it is great. It is outstanding. It is of divine intervention. Romans chapter 5 verse 8 says this. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we are still sinners, Christ died for us. I want to talk just a little bit about that scripture this morning because salvation is for everybody. And so many times I hear this, they say, Pastor Joe, you know, I I see in your scripture that, that while I was still a sinner, Christ died for me, but you know what? I'm just going to hold off. I'm going to hold off being the spiritual leader of my house. I'm going to hold off in opening my spiritual eyes until I get my mess cleaned up. And once I get my mess cleaned up, I'll come to the church. I'll come to the altar. I'll give my life to God. That's not what Scripture's telling us. Scripture's saying is while you are a sinner, where you are at right now in the dirty, dirty world that we live in now, God wants you the way that you are. He wants you. He's ready for you. The Scripture says all. Christ died for all of us. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So not only is this covenant that God's created for us good today, that's why we can stand boldly and say God is good today, things are great today, but it goes for eternity, that we should have everlasting life. John 14, verse 2. This is Jesus speaking. If you look at this in your Bible, it should be in red. And Jesus says this. He says, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Verse 3. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. There it is. It's backing up the prophecy that we just told, that we just talked about. That where I am, there you may be also. Isn't that good? He's telling us. He's telling us out of his own mouth. This is not something that was made up. This is recorded. This is what Jesus was saying. He said, if it wasn't so, I wouldn't say it, and there is a place for you. Is there an exception there in that word you? No, there's no exception for you. And I don't care if you look that up in the Aramaic, if you look it up in the Chaldean, the English, the Spanish, the word you is you. He has already prepared a place for you. He's already prepared a place for me. And I've seen it. I'm there. I'm digging it. Right? My place is going to have an 80-inch TV. It's going to have all my guns on this side and all my bows on this side. Keep my ironing board so I can do all the clothes from a call. My wings are going to have to be ironed because I'm going to be using them a lot. Got that halo going. I ain't ever have to do my hair again. 
But that place is for us. It's for me. And it's for you. John 3, 17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Man, salvation is the greatest thing that we have. And it's for all of us. And God wants you to know this morning that it is for you. Romans chapter 6, verse 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. I'm going to say that again. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Eternal life is a gift. It is a gift. And you can go back and you can look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. There's nothing that you can do to earn it. You can't work enough hours in the week to earn it. You don't have enough money to pay for it. Because he loves us unconditionally, he is giving us the gift of salvation today and for eternity. Isn't that good? Isn't that good that God loves you so much? It's the greatest gift that we could ever, ever receive. Along with a bass boat. <laughs> but it is the greatest, it's the greatest gift. God's in covenant with Israel and God's in covenant with us. He's in covenant with us that have made his son Lord and Savior. He's our protection. So what is a covenant? What is a covenant? I said this before, I started with this. A covenant and a contract are not synonymous. A contract is an agreement between two parties in which they agree to provide stated services for a length of time, but they do not give to themselves unconditionally. So a contract is two people agreeing on something, either services or goods, over a specific period of time. But there's no unconditional part to it. They don't give to each other unconditionally. How many of you have a uh, contract with Ford? How many of you live unconditionally towards the finance manager that helped you buy that Ford pickup truck? <laughs> How many of you live unconditionally to Ford Motor Company? No. no. That's all based on conditions. They are happy with you as long as you make your payments. If you miss one, they call you, and they're not nice. That's the only time you hear from them. They don't want to hear from them when you have problems, right? They don't even want to hear from you if you like what you bought. They don't ever want to hear from you. They just want your money. That's the contract. We give you this, you give us money. But a covenant is an unconditional self-giving like God has given to us. God did not put us in a contract. God loves us unconditionally. There is nothing that you can do that will keep God from loving you. And I know some of your faces, and I went to school with you, and you're going, man, they don't know what we did. No. I highly, highly doubt that any of you have been to the places that I've been and done the things that I've done. And God loves me. I can stand here with everything and scream it from the mountaintops to let you see my heart. God loves me and there's nothing, there's absolutely nothing that I can do to stop it. God loves me unconditionally. He gives everything he has to me. God's got a covenant with Israel, and God has a covenant with you. There's all kinds of different covenants, and we're going to talk about those different covenants in the fall semester. But one of the covenants that God created and that God has instituted himself is the covenant of marriage. So would you please stand to your feet with me?
Would you bow your heads in prayer? Heavenly Father, we just come to you in the name of Jesus and by the blood of Christ. And Lord, I thank you for your creation of the institution of marriage. Lord, I thank you that these two have decided to enter into that covenant. And it is more than a covenant of two. It is now a covenant of three. And Lord, I thank you that you have brought them here, that you have been with them every single step of the way. And now today we get to finalize that covenant with you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. Very, very excited today because I have two of my great, great friends that are here that have decided to uh, uh, get married here at Encounter Church. And I just want to say this before we get started. God's word says about marriage, if we do it God's way, it has a 100% chance of working. And I want to let you know these two right here, they took that even further. And they started a relationship God's way. And the reason that they started a relationship God's way is the reason that we're here today and they're standing here before us. I'm so excited for both of you, and your testimony is amazing because it has God all over it. The reason that we're doing this in this setting today is, is a God idea. And like I said before, I wasn't smart enough to come up with it, but God, but God was. And I can't think of a more fitting place for this ceremony and for this covenant to begin. Sean, do you promise Dana to provide and protect and be the spiritual leader of this union, to love her as Christ loves the church? I do. With these thoughts in mind, listen very carefully from the words of the fifth chapter of the book of Ephesians. Wives, honor your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, also Christ is the head of the church. And he is the savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water of the word. That he might present himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or such a thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Sean, have you made a public profession that Jesus is Lord and personal Savior? I have. Dana. Have you made a public profession that Jesus is Lord and Savior? I have. Now, upon your uh, public profession of faith, you have made it known to all men here that Jesus is your Lord and Savior. To those that are with us here today, I make this announcement before you and to these witnesses. When two people join themselves to the Lord Jesus by faith, they are cleansed, as cleansed before God and Adam and Eve were, in the garden of Eden before they sinned. The Bible says this, any man in Christ is a new creation. Old things have passed away and all things become new. When two born again believers come before God to be joined together in the covenant of marriage, the very creative power of God joins them together. The same power that joined you with Jesus when you made him Lord of your life will now join you together. You are his, he is yours and you are one flesh with the Lord. This is a precious and holy union. Jesus said in the 18th chapter of the book of Matthew, again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them, for my Father in heaven. You are not here just because of tradition, but to bear witness forever of this union and to add your agreement before God. From this day forward, you are to be in agreement, binding your faith with their faith. To the congregation and guest, I would say this. In the eyes of the Almighty God, these two people are washed in the blood of Jesus of Nazareth. They have prayed and believed with all their hearts that it is the perfect will of God for them to be joined together. And they have made this decision, so until the end of this age, I charge you, the congregation and the guests that are here with us today, to do everything in your power to see that this union remains strong, solid, and prosperous. Sean, 
Do you take Dana as your wife, as your own flesh, to love her even as Christ loved the church, to provide and protect her for the rest of your lives? I do. Then repeat these words. I, Sean, according to the word of God. I, Sean, according to the word of God. I leave my mother and father. I leave my mother and father. And I join myself to you. And I join myself to you. I dedicate our marriage. I dedicate our marriage. To be Christ-centered. To be Christ-centered. I will lead. I will lead. Protect. Protect. And provide. And provide. From this moment forward. From this moment forward. We shall be one. We shall be one. Dana. Did you take Sean as your husband, honoring him as unto the Lord, showing reverence to him as the head of this union for the rest of your lives? I do. Then repeat this. I, Dana, according to the word of God, I, Dana, according to the word of God, dedicate myself to you, dedicate myself to, you to be your wife, to, be your wife to, help you fulfill, to help you fulfill our goals and dreams, our goals and dreams as we share our lives with God. From this moment forward, forward, we shall be one. one. Do you have the rings? A ring is a very precious token of your love and faith. It is never-ending circle that indicates the continuing love of God and your devotion to one another. I want you to wear these rings as a continual reminder of your confession of faith to one another, and is a sign of your covenant that you have made today before God. Sean, take the ring and place it on her finger. And repeat after me. With this ring, I thee wed. With this ring, I thee wed. I believe with all of my heart. I believe with all of my heart. This is forever. This is forever. It is a token. It is a token. Of my love, of my love and, faith and faith that I now release, that I now release in, the name of Jesus. in the name of Jesus. Dana, take his ring. And say this. With this ring, I thee wed. With this ring, I thee wed. I believe with all my heart. I believe with all my heart. This is forever. This is forever. It is a token, it is a token of, my love of my love and faith. That I now release in the in the name of Jesus. Always remember this day and to continue to build this relationship on God's word and his love. First Corinthians talks about this love. God's love, along with Sean and Dana, they suffer long and are kind. They do not envy. They do not parade themselves. They are not puffed up. Sean and Dana do not behave rudely. They do not seek their own, and they are not provoked. They think no evil. Sean and Dana do not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoice in the truth. God's love, as long as Sean and Dana, they bear all things, believe all things, hope all things, endure all things, and their love will never fail. Galatians chapter 3 says that Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a, <clears throat> excuse me, redeemed us from the, the curse of the law so that the blessings of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might be heirs of the promise of the Spirit. We have an inheritance through Jesus that we are no longer under the curse of the law, but free to receive the blessing. Listen very carefully as I read to you your inheritance and your blessing. And these blessings shall overtake you because you obey the voice of the Lord. Blessed shall you be in the city and blessed shall you be in the country. The Lord will open his good treasure, the heavens, to give rain to your land and seasons and bless all the work of your hand. You will lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. Blessed shall you be when you come in, and blessed shall you be when you go. Sean and Dana, may this union so be blessed all of the days of your life. At this moment in the ceremony, Sean and Dana have a few things that they'd like to share with you. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, I want to start by saying thank you to my family for coming, and thank you to my parents for a lifetime of love and support. I want to thank Dana's family for, you know, showing up and, and first of all, raising an amazing woman and allowing me to marry her. Uh, Joe wanted me to give my testimony today on kind of how we ended up on such a great day. 
and it, it goes back quite a ways. Uh, Y'all probably don't have five hours for me to, <laughs> to go through my sordid past, but uh, I'll give you a quick snapshot. I, uh, I, wasn't, I wasn't always such a heathen. I, I did go to church. I would go to various churches around the... Around the uh, <laughs> I would go to various churches around the uh, Amarillo area, uh, but I'd show up Sunday morning hungover from being out Wednesday through Saturday night partying and never really allowed myself to get anything out of it. And about five years ago, I uh, ended up coming to Encounter Church by chance that uh, we, I came to a funeral with Greg Jackson for Jennifer Jackson's father and really enjoyed the service. Um, Joe did a great job and ended up, started uh, coming on a weekly basis to the, to, to the services and started getting more involved with the church. However, I was still drinking. So uh, something happened, a, a life-changing event happened about four and a half years ago that made me realize that I either better quit drinking or I'm going to end up dead or in jail. And so I made a covenant with God and promised him that I would never drink again if he healed my life. And I continued to go to church, here at hit an encounter, and Joe started to see a change in me. I was getting more active in the church and showing up at small groups on Wednesday nights, uh, trying to help out at picnics. And like I said, Joe, Joe saw a little bit of a change in me, and he started hinting around about introducing me to this hot blonde that sat on the front row. <laughs> that... Looked like she worked out a lot. Well, <laughs> uh, of course, I, I had noticed her, but... I did not say hot one when I was <laughs> I Sorry, <didn't> McCall. Say... <laughs> <laughs> I, I had... Dana. <laughs> <laughs> so, of course, I had noticed Dana, but I didn't have any liquid courage in me because I'd quit drinking, so I never would introduce myself. And as fate would have it, we ended up in a small group on Wednesday nights and started to become friends. We started talking more and ended up having coffee and going over Bible devotionals and really became aware of how much we had in common. And so about two years ago, I finally got the courage up to ask her on a date, and we have been pretty much inseparable since. So the reason I tell you all this is because, you know, I didn't have much hope in myself but God never lost hope in me. I, I gave myself to God. I've kept my covenant not to drink, and I've seen the rewards by doing things God's way. He was, he was always there whispering in my ear, saying, hey, idiot, do the right thing. But I just drowned him out with alcohol, and it was not the right way. So here I am today, marrying the love of my life, and I couldn't be more grateful. So thank you to everybody for coming. As I stand here this morning, as we stand here, I just want to let y'all know that this here is a promise fulfilled. I prayed for this man before I even knew his name. As I haven't always done the right things um, in relationships, I should say, I've always kind of done it my own way, and I had a lot of consequences to face because of it. Um, I had gotten to where I just... Um, I wanted to test God in this. I had, he had been so faithful in so many areas of my life. He has come through for me and for my kids and for my family and brought restoration to many other relationships when I've obeyed what he's told me to do. But it, I had never really done dating or marriage the way God intended for us to do. So I decided um, it's either God's way or no way for me. I'm done. I'm done trying to do it my own way. And so I prayed a prayer, and I said, God, if you have someone for me, I want them to love you more than they love me. And I will tell you that that prayer changed my life. Um, God is so good and trustworthy. We can trust him with everything. Um, I met Sean here at church, as, as y'all know, and it was God's way, God's time. And, you know, I know that me and him 
we're soulmates. <laughs> you know, we were equally yoked through and through. Um, this did not happen by uh, any coincidence that this is God's divine plan for us. And it's brought on by our obedience, our number one, our surrendering ourselves to him and doing things his way instead of our own way. And so I just want to say God is so faithful. He is so good. Amen. And I'm so thankful that we both made that choice to trust in him and in his word and do things his way. Otherwise, we wouldn't be standing here today. We have the rest of our lives together to Amazing. do. Amazing. Yes. Yep. <laughs> Thank you for your testimony. Let's give him a round of applause. <laughs> Having declared your faith and consented together in holy matrimony before God and these witnesses, and as, and as a representative of Jesus Christ, I pronounce you one together, man and wife, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Sean, you may now kiss your bride. Ladies and gentlemen, I now present to you Mr. and Mrs. Sean Brown. Would you stand to your feet with me? In the Jewish culture, when the word went out, People would simply stretch a hand out. It's nothing weird. It's just what they did when the word was going. When they were in agreement with what was being said and what was happening, they just simply stretched a hand out. And we're going to go into a time of worship. And I'm just going to ask you as we go into this worship, if you're comfortable with it, would you just, would you just stretch a hand out towards Sean and Dana and just be in agreement? that all the days of your life, you're going to do everything that you can to make sure that they're strong and that they're healthy and they're prosperous. Amen. Heavenly Father, we just come to you in the name of Jesus and by his blood. And Lord, we thank you. We thank you for how good you are. We thank you for your word. We thank you for encounter that we had through worship. And we thank you that the encounter we had through your word. And we thank you with this encounter that we've had being together as you three came into covenant together. Lord, I thank you for transformation. I thank you that your, the gospel has gone out and through transformation, somebody gets a revelation and their faith begins to pop and they begin to experience your fullness in a way that they've never experienced. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's worship.
May his favor be upon you in a thousand generations, in your family, in your children, in their children, in their children. May his favor be upon you in a thousand generations, in your children, in your children, in your children, in their children. May his presence go before you and behind you and beside you, all around you. He is with you, he is with you, he is with you in the morning, in the evening, in your coming, and your going, and your weeping and rejoicing. He is for you, he is for you, he is for you, he is for you. He is, he is for you, He is for you, He is for you, He is for you, He is for you. Jesus some praise this morning. Father, we thank you as we close this service today. We just witnessed a union, Father, that is going to be prosperous, that is going to be blessed, that your favor is all over it. Father, we thank you. We thank you that those who came in today, they heard the word of God and that they're going to walk out of here knowing that, Father, you love us unconditionally. That we can't earn your love, it's given through grace. Father, we thank you. And call this morning blessed. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we give Jesus some praise one more time? Thank you guys for being here. I got one announcement for you this morning. August 14th, we're going to kick off Connect Groups with a worship night out in our patio. It's going to be a great time. It's going to be at 630. I would encourage you to be a part of that. We all come together to worship, hear a word, and have an encounter with God. Amen? Thank you all so much. You are dismissed. We'll see you back here next Sunday at 10 o'clock.